Aloha! Welcome to another Mama Presents. And you know me, I'm Jason Schwartz, and we're here in the beautiful Maui Coast Hotel with, dare I even need to say it, John Dessauer. John, aloha, How welcome to our show. Aloha to you. Not Great. only welcome to our show, welcome to Maui. Beautiful place, unbelievable. Well, you know, John is so well known to the group. I purposely wore this shirt thinking that John might wear a Hawaiian shirt, but it's my Nouveau Riche shirt. Now, Nouveau Riche is an interesting, there's a uh, real estate education company on the mainland, and Nouveau Riche, of course, which means new rich, that's you, we'll talk about that. <laughs> this man is a self-made, created millionaire who wrote a book, one of a upcoming series, Real Estate H2O. Quenching your financial thirst in a parched economy. John Dessauer. That's so relevant today, right? Parched oh, economy? Parched. Yeah. I think torched is yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A torched economy. That's the next book. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, the burning bush. That's the one. I know, I know. Okay, well, John, oh, let me ask you a quick question. I see you're uh, almost as big as the bottle, so this isn't real water. That's right. It's real water? Yeah, yeah, real water. <laughs> and you're as big as the apartment buildings. You know, you We call that a giant in the industry. I was going to say you are <laughs> a giant in the industry, standing out among men. Uh, why did you call the book Real Estate H2O? Um, you know, I wanted to uh, give the book a little bit of flavor, almost, and I wanted to give it uh, an idea that everyone can relate to. Uh, when I looked at... Uh, picking a title for it, I thought, you know, that'd be kind of cool if we called it Real Estate H2O, and every chapter would start out about facts about water, and those facts would kind of uh, merge into ideas of real estate. So, for instance, you know, you want to drink eight glasses of water a day to be healthy, right? You need so much real estate in your portfolio for you to be financially healthy. Um, but the flip side of that is, you know, too much water, and it could be detrimental to your health. 
drowning, hurricanes, floods, things like that. So too much of real estate at one time in the wrong type of real estate or the wrong type of deal could be uh, dangerous to you. So I, I took those ideas and I and I uh, kind of merged those together and created the book. And it's it's a really interesting book. I, I think it's a great, easy read. Uh, gives you a lot of foundation on real estate investing. And it's, it's a, a fun book to read, too. I happen to have seen an advanced edition and had a real enjoyable time reading it because it is so comfortable and casual. Now, I met you when you were teaching a significant course on multifamily dwellings. And, by the way, he is so fun in class. You know when you're we're doing something and you're learning a lot, but all that knowledge just sort of sneaks up on you. You go, God, I've learned a lot. <laughs> John makes it fun and easy. And uh, anyway, to be continued. When I think about you, I think about the fact that this is fresh water. This is perfect for Maui because we're surrounded by a lot of salt water with a few sharks here and there. Oh, that, mm -hmm. We don't have sharks. I know. <laughs> but um, you really have to have knowledge and apply it. You know, the, the words due diligence. Right now when you're out there in this real estate market, quenching your thirst can happen. But if you drink the wrong kind of water, you have to really know what you're doing, I'm sure, before you... Yeah, go buy it. Yeah, there's there's that old saying, uh, sailor's proverb: water, water everywhere, but not any to drink, right? Yeah, yeah. And um, you know, when you look at water, you could look at a swimming pool, which is a body of water, and the swimming pool is um, one that you could swim in and dive into, but you couldn't fish, you couldn't really snorkel and get a, uh, a have a fun time with that. You couldn't uh, go scuba diving. You couldn't uh, do some of the other things that you can do on the ocean but there's less risk in the pool. So that's what you have to look at with regard to real estate investing. As I advise people, I like them to start out small. So you know what, get your experience of in the pool, swimming, so on and so forth. Then, you know, kind of go to a lake to get a little bit more experience and the risk is a little bit more than a pool, but not as much as say the ocean. And then once you get to be an experienced investor, you're out in the ocean, and yes, there is more risk, but you get to do more things like uh, fish, you mm -hmm. get to uh, scuba dive, you can uh, water ski, you can do all kinds of I'm stuff. I'm just switching this. This is live TV. <laughs> this is live TV. Okay. Yes. <laughs> and and uh, so that's how I kind of explain risk and due diligence and understanding. Once you have that understanding of what you're getting into, be it water or real estate, you can kind of judge from there and, and exercise that risk like a muscle. And as that muscle gets stronger, you can bring in and tolerate more risk. Well, you know, I'm hearing that. It's triggering in me a realization. Again, I met you in this, in this education environment. And you were a level 400 class. You were an advanced class. But what you say, I mean, you should maybe uh, have a 101 primer for people. You know, there's a class they have called Buyer Beware. Mm -hmm. But um, I think you really just said it clearly. There are different spots to be going swimming. If you're swimming in water and uh, if you go in the deep end of the pool, there are things that can happen that you really don't know. Sure. Like jumping in and doing a 20 unit, 30 unit apartment building sure. when you don't know how to fix a toilet and don't know how to manage a manager. Sure. Yeah, there's, like I said, I think the, the biggest issue for most people when they start out in real estate investing is, you know, they they hear from somebody else, you know what, the ocean's fine, you're going to be fine there, there's nothing that can harm you, you know, I'm right here to hold your hand, and then all of a sudden you jump in the ocean and you look around and there's no one around you, all of a sudden you feel the turbulence and so on and so forth, and, and it's... That's not the problem in itself. The problem comes in when it takes away the quality of life from the other things that you're doing. And, you know, as I tell people, you want to get involved in real estate investing to turn your life around, not turn yourself upside down. And, um, you know, so, so much of what real estate investors do are um, activity. They take action, they're doing due diligence, they're doing their research. And if you're really, truly passionate about real estate, you'll find that it, it blends in with your life. Um, but when that thing gets upset, meaning you've jumped in the ocean and there's no support and you've got to consider the possibility of drowning or meeting up with a shark or you know some of the other things that could happen in an ocean, 
it starts to affect your quality of life. And, and that's why I really want people to start small and grow. And once they get the experience, uh, they can grow into the ocean rather than being thrown into the ocean and worrying about some of the things that uh, you shouldn't have to worry about as a beginning investor. Don't you like us talking about water? I mean, it's, a, it's, not, it's not a dry subject, no, you know what I mean? No, no. That's why thought? we use water. Who but, would have thought? Real estate <laughs> investing, water, you know, we're here But it's Maui. a great thing. Because, you know, what you're talking about, these are really serious topics because people that get involved in real estate, they say, well, I got $20,000. There's a house I can buy out of foreclosure for twenty grand." And then they get in, and even a house that's only $20,000. Yeah. Oh, you got to fix it up. What if the tenant doesn't do this or that or the other thing? It's, it's quite an experience. Yeah. yeah. So how did you design your book? Did it have, it was a river, huh? You had a, a destination. Yeah. What's your destination, and where were you going as you were going? Well, yeah, I wanted to do, it's my first book. I'm writing my second book now, uh, about 70% complete with that. And I want to tell you, you know, when writing a book, a lot of people pay a lot of money for therapy. And if they would just sit down and think of a book that they wanted to write, I believe everyone's got a book in them, somehow, some way. Uh, if they'd sit down and write a book about what they're passionate about, you would not believe the money you could save on therapy because it really is a, a therapeutic situation. Well, but you, uh, you definitely come through loud and clear here. I can tell you know, it's you. You know, I, I, um, I thought about the book and I thought, you know, let's make this user-friendly. Uh, it's an easy read, but let's get some key topics across that people can absorb and start to, you know, uh, consider as a beginning real estate investor. So we cover topics of what to do to get started, what you have to do in your own personal financial situation. Uh, we cover property management a little bit. We talk about increasing value in the deal. Um, the top 10 uh, mistakes I think investors make when they're looking at real estate. So we cover a lot of different topics and I really just laid out the book to, to be a basic thing to help people as a, uh, a starter book almost or starter kit to get themselves rolling. I infuse the whole thing with a lot of stories and, and um, examples on either deals that I've done or stories from my personal or, or family life. And, and again, I think I'm, I'm um, maybe a little bit different in with some of the things that I teach where I, I like to bring a lot of my life experience in there. That's what real estate investing is. Um, I tell people, use your life experience. It's going to be your best educator in doing a deal. If it doesn't feel right, don't do it. You know, you, you've got experience. Now, what are you now, 22, 23 now, 24? 24. Okay, we'll go with 24. So you've got 24 <laughs> years of experience of knowing what it's like to live in a piece of real estate, some kind of real estate, an apartment, a tent, a mobile home, a house, a mansion. Use that experience. What does it feel like? You know what it, it's like to deal with people, negotiate, um, communicate to people, uh, be it a parent, a sibling, a friend, a business partner, a boss. Um, use that experience when dealing in real estate. If somebody's presenting a deal to you and you think, you know, something's not right about that person that's telling me the deal. Something's not right about the deal. It seems too good to be true. And your gut is telling you that, your gut is probably giving you the best indicator that that may not be the deal for you. Well, you know, Ariel is really good at that. Ariel is able to, to smell a deal. Just She just has that feeling. She's really been intuitive about it. Yeah, and you, you, that's a good way. And a little knowledge doesn't hurt. I mean, a little, the, the nuts and bolts. What I'm hearing about this in your book, you know, my experience of you was at the advanced class. I mean, multifamily, you made it so easy. I literally, I don't want to say it too loud, but I throw out a lot of other things now because of having taken your class. But I had to go through the learning of them to be able to appreciate mm. the difference right. between what they are and what, you, what you're teaching. Mm. So this book is a great thing that we don't see of you in class. You throw it out there, but this really goes into goes into the deep end of the pool. Sure, <laughs> sure. Uh, you know, in, in that class that you're talking about, we, we cover a lot of topics with regard to multifamily units, apartment buildings. In this book, I cover more of a real estate in general, single family houses mm -hmm. and apartment buildings and basically what you have to do to get your own personal financial house mm -hmm. in order before investing in real estate. So it's a lot more 
generalized, a lot more basic. Uh, and a lot of common sense things, like when you're talking about how to manage managers and how to manage situations, how to um, have people show up when you have appointments with them. Yeah, yeah. And really, really good. Very friendly and easy to read. I'm sure this is going to do really well. If you guys see Real Estate H2O, pick it up. Have a drink. There you go. Drink it up, as I tell people. Now, besides where I saw you at Nouveau Riche, you do your own thing. You, yeah. I've seen regular um, things from you all the time. Mm -hmm. The Dessauer Group. We do. Uh, my company is called the Dessauer Group, and we do events all over. Um, uh, we, uh, I, I never considered myself uh, much of a world traveler until I created my own destiny in the companies that I own. Now I find myself traveling to areas like Maui. How beautiful is this? Uh, meeting great people, and. Uh, it's almost like you know when you control your own destiny as an entrepreneur, um, and you travel, you come home with stories. When you travel as a tourist, you come home with trinkets. So, you know, here I am in Maui, and and uh, with Jason, and and uh, probably going to have some stories from this. But uh, yeah, we will. We do a lot of our own uh, events. I like to infuse a lot of life situations in them. So you'll see a lot of our event, events on cruises or. Uh, in really neat locations, oh, nice. and um, we're really involved in a lot of foundations. We give uh, quite a bit back. I just got back from Haiti, which um, I sit on the board of directors of a uh, foundation called the Caring House Foundation. We build sustainable villages in third world countries. And um, we need one here. We have an extreme shortage of housing. Well, it, it's you know it's interesting uh, as I got more involved in this. Um, and I'll get back to the Death Hour group, I guess, in a moment. But yeah. as I got more involved in uh, the giving portion of what I do, uh, I really realized that you, ne you don't feel more alive than when you uh, participate in something that the rest of the world forgets. And uh, places like Haiti and areas in uh, Africa where uh, the Sudan, Darfur, you know, just desperate, desperate, basic yeah. life necessity uh, things you you just you never feel more alive when you're you're focusing and working on those things. So it, it's a real important part of my life and uh, the Death Hour Group with uh, what we do. Our events are really education driven. Uh, we like to uh, give a lot of educational content. We've got different programs, mentor programs that. Uh, start out with basic conference calls. We, we do a call every single week. Yeah, I enjoy. People get on. Uh, you're on the calls? Yeah. I get and, on and uh, off. We are I'm called out, but called out, when yeah. I I when I can and I'm near your time, I uh, we we co we cover some great great topics. Mm -hmm. Yesterday we uh, focused on uh, the four ratios that I teach that you probably I know. I do. NOI. Yeah. Right, uh, I well, cap rate, cap rate, right? Right. cash return on investment, CROI, okay, total return on total investment, total return on investment, and debt service coverage ratio. See, these are important things. You know, they were multifamily, but I would have loved to have applied them in my residential purchases also. Yeah, and we try to in those hour calls per week. We cover content. So much of conference calls are driven to other people's objectives and what they want you to do and. You know, I, I want these calls to be educationally driven. The, the best part of those calls, by the way, and, and that particular program is called the um, Achieve Program. Okay. Uh, the best part of those calls are when the rest of the members of the group, which we're somewhat of a close-knit group, you know, um, but the rest of the members of that group ask specific questions either about deals or about real estate investing. When you have the question, you know, someone else probably has the question in the group. So um, that's a good portion of it. We do things. We're going to the multi-family uh, uh, housing world expo in, in Denver, Colorado, in September oh, as a group. Um, a lot of lot of really cool things. So so uh, if you want more information, uh, go to... We're going to put up the website. JohnDessauer.com. John Dessauer, D-E-S-S-A-U-E-R. You got it. Dot C-O-M. I didn't know that part. Yeah, sure. But uh, you can certainly <laughs> go there and find out all the info on that. Okay. John Dessauer, besides being a uh, charming and handsome and rich young millionaire, is also self-made. I, I think people would like to kind of hear your story because I don't seem to admit it. You thought I was only 24, <laughs> but I'm actually 
I'm older than you. Can you imagine? Anyway, but I know that you discovered in your life this path where you had some time to do it. So many of you out here who are my age are saying, Greg, you have to learn about that. I have to have something for my retirement. What is, how can I retire? But many of you are young. What would it make a difference in your life if while you were young, you could do this and take it over time and build that portfolio yeah. based on the knowledge? Well, um, I started out the son of two poor sharecroppers. I'm just kidding, Jason. Uh, three. Three. Um, no, I, I uh, grew up in Chicago on the south side of the city. And um, my father passed away when I was uh, young at four, four years of age. And, um, you know, that's traumatic in itself. But then when you look at the family unit and what has to go on and survive there as a mother, a single mother raising four children and, and wow. doing the things that they need to do, um, it, 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 you know, becomes a little bit of a desperate situation. But as I remember it, I always had a great childhood. We always didn't have everything, but I had a great childhood. And um, I, I think uh, uh, I have to go back to Haiti a moment. When I was in Haiti a, a month ago, all these children that have nothing had smiles on their faces like uh, you would not believe. Great. And there's something to that, you know. Um, but uh, so, you know, I grew up in a great environment, always didn't have everything. And I think that kind of instilled in me the... the um, uh, the fact that, you know, hey, if you want it, you've got to go get it. Simply take action, and, and I think you can create what you want. I, I was in other people that had uh, a lot more than we did, but I realized quite early on that um, if I was going to have that, I was going to have to create it. I don't want to say there was a competition, but it was almost a competition in me to make that happen. And I know it sounds kind of cliche, um, but I, I went to college. I uh, was lucky enough to get a basketball scholarship, and and uh, played basketball in college and, and had a great education. I graduated in uh, 1991, uh, which, uh, as I tell people, there was some kind of management shift that went on in 91 where, um, you know, if you if you were to keep goofing up, they were going to promote you. You know, that's how middle and upper management goes. You know? I think we got a president that way. Yeah, I think. Oh, that was the well, first one we'll of those. That, we'll leave oh. that to the next oh. show. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, yeah. yeah, you know, it, it seemed like in, in life, the corporate world, politics, the more you goof up, the, the uh, higher you go. And uh, I realized that. I realized early on as I, I moved up in, in uh, that world, maybe I was goofing up too much, but uh, that, that was not a, an area that I wanted to be. Uh, I remember speaking in New York City uh, uh, several years ago and saw a sign in Times Square that said... Uh, if you don't control your own destiny, someone else will. And I, I thought about that a little bit. I remember seeing that sign and I, I was um, um, kind of taken back by that. I said, that is so true. So much of today, uh, what we do either as investors or as in business, uh, we put our destiny in someone else's hands. And more times than not, that doesn't work out the best it should. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I often uh, tell people uh, to ask themselves a question. Are you using leverage or are you someone else's leverage? And when you're someone else's leverage, you're always battling the uh, idea of somebody else's objectives. And when you're using leverage, such as in the investment world with, uh, say, apartment buildings, when you're using leverage, uh, you now have other people working for you. If you go out and buy a 24-unit apartment building, you've got 24 tenants going to their job to give you the most important check of the month. Um, I like that. I, I grasped that at a fairly young age, um, and probably not as early as I should have, but I, I was uh, grasped at a fairly young age. So what I ended up doing was I left the corporate world, and I immediately started the process of becoming an entrepreneur. Um, and my entrepreneurial path was through real estate investing. Now that's led to some other things that I do today, but um, uh, my pathway was real estate investing. Uh, I love the fact of being an entrepreneur. As a matter of fact, um, one of the things that sparked that, because of our family situation growing up, I had always lived in apartment buildings. The first house I ever lived in was the first one I bought for myself and my family. 
So uh, I, re I can remember uh, as a kid seeing that owner of that apartment building seemed to have more of a freedom than my mother did when she was working two jobs, sometimes more. Um, and I said, you know, I want that in my life. I learned that as a lesson. I don't know how he did it, but I got to have that. And that was what the almost the motivation was uh, for me. So um, I left my corporate position, and uh, that was about... 1990, it was about 2000, I want to say. It was about eight years ago, nine years ago. And um, really took action and made the commitment to take action. And, and I took action even when I didn't know exactly what to do. And I know that sounds a little bit funny, but what I realized was, uh, and what I've learned today, is even when you don't know exactly what to do, if you just take some kind of action, you learn so much quicker. So for instance, if you didn't know anything about real estate investing in the apartment market, and you said, I don't know what to do, just sit, pause, and say, what would be the first, if I did know what to do, what do you think I would do? And I, I know this sounds kind of crazy, like I'm talking to myself in my own mind. And you sit there and you say, well, probably the first thing I would have to do is talk to somebody that sells real estate, like a real estate agent or broker. So I'm just gonna go set up a meeting, with a real estate agent or broker. That's the, it's as simple as that. That's how you start. And you take action. I'm getting excited. I'm spitting here, Jason. But uh, uh, it's as simple as that. You take action in that method. And what I found is you are able to accomplish so much more. And people second guess you, like, how did you know how to do all that? How did you, how did you accomplish that? I simply just took action. Even when I didn't know what to do, I did something. And that's probably made the, the biggest difference from where I was then and where I'm at today. And really the fruits of that labor, the fruits of that action has been, um, you know, some of the things that I talk about in the book, which is uh, really a free, five freedoms. You know, Hawaii in general is very spiritualistic, very mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, touchy-feely type, type of, of thing, earthly. And one of the things that I realized is the, the things that we strive for when we're working in the corporate world or wanting to become an, uh, an entrepreneur is, you know, we want time freedom, we want money freedom, we want physical freedom, relationship freedom, spiritual freedom. And the only way to get those type of freedoms is to control your own destiny. And, uh, you know, today I'm able to, like I said before, travel, meet great people, be on great shows, um, write a book. This, this book uh, actually is, is the uh, product of the uh, time freedom that I had. Most people don't have time to write a book, therefore they don't. Most people don't have time to do yoga or, you know, uh, meditate or do some of the things for spiritual freedom, therefore they don't. So in creating that uh, situation for myself, I was able to receive all these these benefits, and uh, it just seems like the more leverage I had in my life, the more apartment buildings I buy, the more of those things that I can get because of other people um, uh, going to their nine to five to cut me that check. May I talk a little personal? Sure, I'm sorry. Yeah, you've set up a. I was going to say a small empire. I don't know, but I mean just on. Today, while we're getting ready, John is, you know, making offers on a couple of uh, places. Quite a spectrum of uh, properties, both apartment buildings, mm -hmm. one small and one like it's an apartment building in a large yeah. building. Yeah. So you deal in all kinds of markets and you've acquired and built a small empire. I, um, yeah, I have. Uh, and you named your children so you can give them each an empire? That's right. Peyton and Jordan, That's huh? right. Uh, Jordan and Peyton, <laughs> Peyton and Jordan, uh, are my daughters, yeah. uh, 16 and 14. And uh, for those of you that have daughters out there, you know that I'm, I'm probably a little bit challenged coming home in a house be full of estrogen <laughs> and emotions and things like that. But uh, um, I, I very much attribute my investment style to what I think uh, happens in, say, the NBA draft. I know there's not an NBA team here in Hawaii, but... Um, a lot of times in the NBA draft, the National Basketball Association, instead of drafting a center or a guard or a position player, they often draft the best athlete. And I look at that as my investment criteria. When I'm looking at deals, I'm not specifically looking for a 100-unit complex or a four-unit building. 
or a duplex, I'm looking for the best athlete. So when I put the numbers through my system and the results of those equations or formulas tell me that this is a good deal, that's the best athlete that I can draft or buy at that time, so I go for it. Um, so, you know, in, in the deals that I look for, it could be an eight unit building, could be a duplex, could be a 148 or 180 unit complex. Um, and uh, uh, that's kind of been my cr criteria all along as I've uh, been able to acquire multifamily units. Do you uh, keep buildings around as projects? I know a lot of people get real personal about their buildings. Or do you look at them as part of your business? Do you ever make them personal? Besides your home and maybe... Yeah, a... you know, it's interesting. Um, I was dealing with a woman one time where I was buying, I wanted, I was looking at buying her uh, two apartment complexes and um, they were a couple, uh, elderly, uh, didn't have any children and they considered the two apartment complexes their children. And uh, they were immaculate, uh, so on and so forth. The problem with that is that they wanted an exorbitant amount of money because they were their children. Attached to the sense. children, yeah. As an investor, uh, you cannot get emotional about the deal. You have to keep the emotions out and focus solely on the numbers. Uh, you've got to be able, uh, able to walk away from a deal at any time. You also have to be able to uh, understand uh, what those numbers are going to give you and what your play is on the property. And I think if you can kind of uh, swim your way through that, and, and understand. You brought out the winds. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And and swim your way through that and Stop. understand. You guys don't mind the little squeaking. Isn't that funny? How about that? Well, that was good. It All right. Go. <laughs> uh, but once you are I got able you. to do that, you can now find a, a way to make good investment decisions, keeping the emotion out of it, and really separating yourself as an investor from other people. That is huge. Separate yourself as an investor from other people. So many people, whether it be apartment building, I brought it up for a reason. They get so attached to the house. Unless it's your dream house, you really have to look at it extremely analytically, because if you look at the numbers, that's going to, it gets much more clear. I think that was what most attracted me to your strategies, is that you boiled it down to, to science. It wasn't an emotional choice. Mm. A very, very important yeah, lesson. Uh, the, the one thing that I think uh, most investors need to understand that is that investing is um, cog uh, it's a very cognitive thing, where you, you're... Um, uh, putting it through almost a machine and the product or what comes out of that machine is going to tell you what to do. My machine are the ratios that I talk about and the formulas yeah. that I use to uh, look at a deal and the, re the result or product of that those formulas tell me exactly what to do. Um, I never let my emotions get in it. So I never look at an eight unit building and say, oh I love that building, the brick is so beautiful, the landscape is gorgeous, I gotta have it. If the numbers aren't there, I don't buy it. Right. So. And I like your other comment that you make. You know, I appreciate the personal time getting to share. If it looks too good to be true, look harder. It might be a great deal, but look harder. The level of due diligence quotient should go up, or the factor should go up yeah. as the opportunity is looking better, I would think. When you look at a return on, on an investment and you look at the idea of um, what you're getting in return for putting up some cash or putting in some money into a deal and you get an exorbitant return right from the get-go, typically something's going on there. Um, so what I tell my students or people that I work with is proceed with a deal but proceed with caution. You know, it flows up, throws up some red flags a little bit. So. Um, you know, usually you've heard that saying, you know, it seems too good to be true, it probably is. That, that probably applies in real estate very well. Not that you don't ever find really good deals from the get-go, because I don't want to second guess why a seller's selling the property that way, but right. I just want to be more detailed with my 
due diligence and really find out what's going on there. And don't be afraid to get a good deal because you're second guessing That's the deal. Right. I see. That's right. Well, you know, having read, like I say, the first version, I know that a lot of what we're talking and so much more is here in your book. And in the same kind of style like we're talking, yeah. very comfortable yeah, and real laid available, back, you know, sort of Hawaii-like, very That's Maui. Right. That's right. Real estate H2O, quenching your financial thirst in a parched economy. I think we're in a uh, torched economy yeah. now, I think. Yeah. Um, do you mind we sort of get more current events? Not at all. Not at all. Um, what do you see going on and what do you think is happening here? Um... You know, it's really, uh, it's really an interesting time. Um, I, I've, I've been able to, um, I don't want to say call what's going on, but I've been pretty close to it. Um, yeah. In the book, uh, I talk about um, a, a diagram that I, I, when I talk about timing markets and market cycles and things like yeah, that, it's that called the fish. You probably remember that from the That book. was a very important, I think you almost started the whole thing with that. Yes. To let us know the cycles. Yes. This has happened before in our economy where we are right now, and, and I think Americans have a, 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 a short memory. But if you go back, you know, and you can go back probably since the beginning of time, but if you go back just from uh, an aspect of, just go to 1974, you know, we had a, uh, a, a gasoline shortage, uh, a fuel and oil and, and energy crisis then. Do you uh, remember that? I know we have a new one. Yeah. No and, shortage. And, and a shortage a, of shekels. That's right. And, and it was a shortage of gasoline. I know they talk about supply and demand today, but it was a little bit different time, but that really affected our economy. You remember the you know, lines of cars at gas stations, and you probably remember that from New York, right? Um, well, you know, I'm a renewable energy advocate from way back when. I can't imagine how a whole generation went by and we didn't do anything that we had so abundantly yeah. in our face. But do you remember how fast that dissipated? If, if you remember, you know, 75, 76, it just kind of dissipated. And typically in market cycles, that's what happens. We, we seem to forget um, a lot of those things. So it happened in 74. It happened again in the early 80s when we had high interest rates. Uh, 18% and you know really affected the economy in a, in a uh, drastic way uh, the late 80s early 90s actually we had the savings and loan crisis you know very similar to today with the banking uh, industry um, now we do have a little bit of the double whammy with the oil and the, the banking today but yeah. uh, it happened again in 2001 with the, the uh, unfortunate uh, terrorist acts and we as a country go through this, and the reason that we do is because we're capitalistic in nature. We have to have market cycles with what we do as being a, a capitalistic economy. If we were a socialistic economy, we'd be flatlined. It'd be very boring. It, you know, we wouldn't be able to you know, do the things that we get to do as Americans and have our freedom. But interestingly enough, here's what I think is going to happen. I think oil is going to come down in price. Uh, I think Americans have made some, some different choices with respect to what they do on a daily basis. And I think that's going to start to affect that uh, demand side of the equation. So I, I see oil getting back to about $100 a, a barrel by the end of the year. Now I'm on tape, so you'll, you check December 31st, and I bet you we're around $100 a barrel. I think in 2009, uh, as we move through there, uh, when we get to the spring summertime period of that will probably be even around the $70 mark uh, for that reason. Now again, you check and see if I'm You see right. these shades move, that's the judge. We'll be able to tell. That you, meant yes. Yeah, you guys you guys <laughs> let me know how uh, if I called that right. Now, that's excluding any like significant act of war, terrorism, things like that that would adjust that. If we don't have any of that, I think we're going to be fine. Um, the other thing with respect to the real estate market, and that's a question I get all over, uh, no matter where I travel, uh, is uh, I think the real estate market is, is uh, in 2008 going to remain how it is right now. There's going to be no recovery in the market. It doesn't happen overnight. It happens over a, a duration of time. 2009 will start to heal that process. Uh, 09 will be a much better year than 08 with respect to real estate. Inventories will go down, prices will start to stabilize. Um, it will not be what we just came out of by any means. You know, the high appreciation and, and uh, the availability to get loans will just not be what it was. But we will start to heal in 09. 
09, again, like I said, will be a much better year than 08. What about the so many people that have gotten kind of crushed by this recent mortgage challenge where now they can't refinance their own houses? And Yeah, I'm on a theme right now because uh, I get that question a lot too. Yeah. And I think people get caught up in that own, that, that negativity. Yes, it happened. They may end up being in a bad situation right now. Um, and I think it comes to a point where you have to say, so what, now what? So what, now what am I going to do about it? Just like when I talk about uh, uh, be, becoming an entrepreneur and taking action even when you don't know how. You might be in a situation where you have a mortgage, you've got an investment property that's not cash flowing. Uh, rather than stick your head in the sand and try to avoid the problem, let's do something about it. What would I do if I had a, mor if I had a house, an apartment building, whatever it is, that wasn't cash flowing, what would I do? Well, I'm going to take action even when I don't know exactly how. There's not someone to my right or my left telling me exactly what to do. I would sit there and say, you know what, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to call my bank and I'm going to say to my bank, listen, I got into this deal. It wasn't how it was set up. The appraisal might have been bad. Something else might have happened. What can I do from this point? Can you, do you guys have a program? And you know what, the people that do that find that the banks are willing to work with them. Because rather than take back another REO, they would rather say, let's help you out of this pro process. Maybe uh, uh, eliminate the interest or l reduce the interest on the loan. Um, uh, suspend the payments for six months till the property gets stabilized. There's all kinds of programs that they could go through. So again, in these times, I tell people, say, so what, now what? What am I going to do about it? Let's take action and, and we'll work ourselves out of this. That's what an entrepreneur in real estate, they, they work. This is not something, you know, like I was joking before we started, it's like when you start to hear the things, it's so easy a caveman can do it, wrong. That's not what we do as investors. We work. We use our minds. We create leverage. We, we, we're, we're problem solvers. And uh, that's how we're going to get out of this mess. Well, you know, I'm going to bring up a personal story. Generically, how's that? I had that issue happen where we bought a pre-construction deal in Florida and none of the buyers could qualify because of the mortgage problem. The real estate agent that was getting us this house and selling it, they bailed out of the industry and they gave us these houses back. That was 20, something, 20 months ago, something like that. And the lender worked with me and now they offered me a deal. You know, they talk about short sales and that you can't renegotiate. They offered us $70,000 less than when we bought the construction loan. So it was actually, it's now a much more um, interesting investment because everything's now been adjusted, but couldn't do that without the knowledge. Seat of my pants but see, plus a little knowledge. That's opportunity there, right? You, 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 in the, even in this negative time, you've got opportunity. Oh, and yeah. the point that I, I think everybody should know on this, this show and, and uh, in this environment is more millionaires will be made in, because of this situation than three years ago when the boom was going on, two and a half years ago. The, the, the opportunity is here. It wasn't three years ago, it's here. And um, I gotta, I'm gotta. i gonna read something in a book, okay. uh, the book here, if I can, if this is cool, sure. Jason. Uh, We're good. I gotta remember the, the, the page it's on. I think it's on page, uh, there we go. It's on page two. I just want you to read a little thing. I'm speaking here, as you know. And I'm gonna start off my speech with this uh, with this statement here. Uh, Once upon a time, there were two market researchers who worked for a giant shoe company. Both were dispatched to a far-off, underdeveloped country to gauge the market for shoes. When the first researcher's email hit the home office, it read, no market here, nobody wears shoes. The second researcher had a different take. His email read, great market here, nobody wears shoes. Right. <laughs> and so... You know, those are the type of things that are in the book, but um, you look at that situation, how many people today are saying, oh, real estate is terrible, I'm never going to get involved, I got burned. You turn that negative situation into somewhat of an opportunity. Mm -hmm. I would challenge people uh, that are watching the show and, and uh, um, others that if you can take these moments that other people are ignoring, running away from, um, putting their head in the sand, and you become a problem solver, 
you will make a lot of money in this environment. I really believe that. Now is the time. It's not two years down the road. It wasn't two years before. It's right now. I hope that makes all you real estate agents happy, but also all you sellers, all you potential buyers, all the people out there with a dream. You know, I'm changing the subject a little out of real estate. When I came to this island, I wanted to contribute something. I wanted to add something too. And um, this is the kind of thing that dreams are made of. By being able to add just what John said here. Opportunity comes when you see it and create it in any kind of condition. If you're going to a store, when do you want to buy something? When it's on sale. Do you think that things might be on sale because you have a great deal of motivated sellers? Might be, right? And um, I hope that everyone can be positive and optimistic about what's going on. You know, I, I myself have gone through a lot of challenge from all that's going on in the market. And yet, with the knowledge I got and with my ability because to be able to apply that knowledge and my innate, like you say, okay, what am I going to do here? This is upside down. I can uh, crawl to the side and wait for them to hit me, or I can be proactive. In that proactivity, I always create more opportunity. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that's uh, hopefully a lesson we can all learn. Absolutely. You know, we can talk forever, and I hope to... We're going to get some more conversation going on, but we can't take over the television for hours and hours, I think. I think the most important thing now is to give you a chance to say, you know, what do I want to be sure to communicate to the people of Maui and the world? Because we're also on the Internet, and yep. maybe we'll even be up on your page for a while. Sure. Uh, you know, I think the thing that I'd like to communicate today is the opportunity that we have uh, with the uh, market today. You've got to take action. You have to put yourself in a position to actually say those words. So what? Now what? Yeah, the economy is not the greatest right now. Gas prices are high. Um, you know, uh, it's harder to get financing. Okay, we know those. That situation is current. What do we need to do about it? Uh, is there another way? Do we need to get more creative on deals? Um, uh, do you need to uh, look at opportunities a little bit differently? And I think if you put yourself in that state of mind and really become a problem solver, you start to find ways to make money where no one else thinks you can. Right. And, you know, that's probably the greatest lesson that I've seen is when everyone is going one way, you want to go the other way. So um, it, it, the reason that is is because how can you ever expect to get different results if you do the same thing that other people are doing? Yeah. And uh, I just challenge people uh, that are watching the show to, to make a difference, take action, and, and uh, say so what in the face of uh, this economy and environment here. Well, words of wisdom from a very wise and very humble and very, very nice man. John. Thank you. Thanks a lot for having You're me. You're welcome. So we were going to give John a shirt that says Dream Reach. You know, Ariel and I have our LLC, Dream Reach LLC. Cool. But I don't know if you're an extra large. You're more like an extra extra. It's all the muscles that I get. It's muscles. You know, sure. Anyway, so um, we'll see if this fits. If not, we'll get one to you and bring it to you at college. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. This book is a must-have and really very comfortable. I must tell you, though, if you bring it to bed to read and think you're going to fall asleep, doesn't do that to you. It kind of energizes you. It's a good morning reading. It's great for relationships, you know. Uh, you know, it sparks <laughs> the romance and the relationship. Who needs flowers? Give a book. <laughs> That's right. That's and you can get it at johndussauer.com, uh, soon to be in Barnes & Noble, Borders, so on and so forth. But right now, before everybody else can get it, you get it at johndussauer.com. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's interesting when I think about this. This is water. There's another instructor who I know is a friend of yours, Tony Litster. Mm -hmm who has a uh, program, Water, Weed, Repeat. Yes. Was he down there in Haiti with you? He was not, no. Okay. No. Because he also spoke of Haiti as an area that really needs help. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, it's really nice to hear that you who have so much and have accumulated so much are also aware that giving and sharing mm -hmm. and, you know, 
giving back. What a blessing we have. Yeah. We could be in a situation like that. And so that's really wonderful. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. You got it. Real Estate H2O, quenching your financial thirst in a parched economy. John Dessauer. It's a pleasure, John. Thanks again. All right. Be well. Aloha. And everyone, Aloha. thank you for joining us. And um, please, if you want John back, we will go and get him and bring him back here again. Or, Great. or we'll go wherever. But I think, yeah, I think we should get you back here. Sure. You? Anytime. Anytime. See, we have a draw here in Maui, so we're going to do that. Thanks a thank lot. Thank you very much. Aloha. We're going to say goodnight, but we're going to bring Jason, the cameraman, up here to help us sing the song. Jason, the cameraman. We will be back here in two weeks, two Sundays from now. And if America agrees and Joy agrees, we'll bring back the trio again. The quartet going on a quintet. Oh, we got a quintet.
Yeah, stay.